Good morning. Welcome to NYU Center for Cybersecurity annual Women Leaders in Cybersecurity Conference. We are thrilled to have you all here and thrilled to once again show for the world that there are phenomenal women leading the critical work on important cybersecurity issues of today. There's a sign in my kitchen that says life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And when we talk about the issues at the juncture of technology, security, and privacy, there is no room for comfort, complacency, or status quo. We need critical thinkers working from an interdisciplinary perspective, drawing upon expertise in technology, law, and policy to address these issues, considering ethics, human rights, freedom of speech, censorship, the difficulties of how far can a company go to protect its systems without unduly encroaching on privacy or taking security too far to a level of inappropriate surveillance. Questions of where do we draw the lines between our security and our privacy interests from a global perspective where different countries have different laws and views and norms of how they consider what even is private. What does privacy mean? Traditionally, there would be people who would focus on privacy. There would be people who would focus on security, people who would focus on technology. But in our world today, those are all one and the same in a big pot of interesting and complex issues. And all too often, we sit at the table looking at the boardroom, the executive leadership team, congressional testimony, and we see a lot of men discussing these issues. And people say, well, there just aren't a lot of women in this field. And the good thing about this conference is it shows there are plenty of women doing amazing work. Not enough, not enough yet, but terrific women leading these important discussions. And at NYU, we are privileged, honored, and excited to show for you some of the leading women in our field as a message to say these are the women who should be considered further for more leadership positions and to show for girls and, and um, others considering whether a field, a job in cybersecurity might be something they should consider to say, yes, you can. Don't let anyone tell you you can't. Don't sit back and be comfortable doing what you think you're supposed to do. These are important issues. We need critical thinkers. And it's time to have the discussion among some leaders. And with that, I welcome you. I want to introduce our first panel today, discussing cybersecurity defenses and proactive measures. We have um, a terrific panel. We could spend the whole time reading the bios, but you have them in your programs for the day. I will ask our panelists to introduce themselves as they start the discussion. And thank you again for joining us today. By the way, I should have said I'm Judy Germano. <laughs> I'm from NYU. I'm a, a distinguished fellow in the Center on Law and Security and uh, an adjunct professor at the law school, a professor in the Master in Cybersecurity Risk and Strategy program, and the conference host today. I also want to thank the folks who have helped us, um, including <coughs> Sarvanaz Bakhtiar, our director of operations for the Center on Law and Security, Alex Pokofra, who is our program director, and the, the team of folks, some of whom you'll hear from today, who have helped to make this event possible. And also the Comfort Family Fund, who has helped to sponsor our event. So with that, and without further ado, I welcome our panel. Thank you again. OK, good morning, everybody. Hello. This is the, uh, the first panel of the day. And we're going to be talking about uh, cyber defense. The, that's the theme of this panel. We're going to cover a number of different areas. Uh, we're going to start with very brief introductions, and then we're going to jump right in, and there will be time for uh, questions at the end, if you have questions. My name is Michaela McMurrow. I'm a partner at Covington & Burling, the law firm, uh, and I'm a member of the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Practice Group. I'm Edna Conway. I'm the Chief Security Officer for Cisco Systems Value Chain, so I worry about our million-plus products. I'm Andrea Little Lombago. I'm the Chief Social Scientist at Endgame, which is a cybersecurity company in the DC area. Melody Hildebrandt, the CISO at 21st Century Fox, parent company to Fox News Sports, uh, National Geographic, Star India. 
Sophia D'Antoine, security researcher at Trail of Bits and hacker in residence at NYU. Okay, thank you. We're gonna jump right in. And Edna, I'm gonna start with you. You're sitting next to me. When we talk about cyber defense, what are we talking about? And you know, really, it's, it's a broad theme, but what does it mean, and what exactly are we trying to protect and defend? So, so I've been on a mission. First of all, let me ask, can you guys hear me? Yes, are we good? Okay, terrific. Uh, for a while now, to talk about cyber in a new way. So I think that the currency of the digital economy is actually trust. It's the same currency we had years ago when we were all in caves and we were worried about whether or not the guy behind us was gonna club us or the woolly mammoth. Same currency. What I see is a lot of focus on cyber as if it exists in isolation, and it doesn't. Um, so I think what we're trying to do is think comprehensively about physical security logical or operational security with security technology embedded within it, and then think about information security. And on top of that, blend in the human element of behavioral security. If you start to think about what we're defending as an integrated environment in which humans and devices, which are run by software, actually function, then you begin to think about a defensive environment that is no longer a perimeter, but is pervasive. So it's not a perimeter defense. We're not trying to defend a boundary. It's really an idea, a concept. Is that right? I, look, you have to defend the perimeter too, but I, I think that's a piece of it. I think you need to start by thinking big picture, and that will allow you to develop an architecture and an implementation plan that gives you a risk-based approach to cover in a comprehensive way. Mm -hmm. Okay, Melody, how do we set priorities for defense? So in the context of what Edna's talking about, how do we decide, you know, given limited resources, what do we, what do we uh, you know, identify as our top priorities in terms of protecting the system that Ed is talking about? Yep, uh, you know, I think about this in terms of you know, what are the essential, for defense, like what are the essentials I think basically all companies should be doing that are, you know, if you were to come into an environment blind, like what are the things, and you, want, you were charged with defending it, what are the set of things that if you're a small business up to like a large business you want to be focused on? Things in that category would be like, a common single sign-on system, using as much cloud as possible, multi-factor authentication on key systems, logging of you know, activity on systems. So you have kind of like those, those essentials. And then you think about in the context of your business, you know, for our business, like what are our crown jewels? And our crown jewels range from Avatar in our film studio to you know, live sports as transmitted on Fox Sports. And there's very different kind of threat models associated with um, protecting those discrete types of crown jewels. So then on top of the basics, which are common to all of our businesses at Fox, there's like specific things that are you know, essentially determined by the crown jewel that we're trying to protect and then the threat model that we think about that would threaten that, that item um, or that, that set of things, um, which the way Edna described is you know, it's probably like more application level, data level, and so we have like different levels of thinking about that protection or even just you know, in, un, uninterrupted service. In our case, we have a 24 seven news network. Um, so they, that's kind of how we, I think we break it down, like the basics and then this like, contingent on each business. So there's a level of cyber hygiene that's kind of common to, or should, or should be common to, to most businesses, regardless of scale. And then there are the business specific defenses that you need to think about, is that right? That's right. So, Sophia, I wanna um, get your thoughts on that really quickly, just as a security researcher from the perspective of like the basic cyber hygiene. Do you have any ideas about so that? So one thing that I was thinking of when you guys were discussing this was a data perspective. So at the end of the day, what do we use cyber for? We use cyber things to store and transmit data. And from my perspective, data should never be insecure, unencrypted, um, at rest or in transit. It should only be accessible to the authority that it's you know, allowed for um, at the time of use. And so if you can assure that um, somehow through good software, through good crypto, through good authorities, through good you know, authentication, um, then you're doing a pretty good job. So I'm gonna shift gears for a minute. We talked about what we're defending, we've talked about some, some basic ideas, but how, how do we defend? And what does a good cyber defense look like? And I think what, the way, where I'd like to start with this is the, the comparison and the analog to the, the brick and mortar world, if you will, right? So Sophia, I'm gonna come back to you on this. I'd like you to talk briefly about how cyber defense compares, if it does, to traditional notions of defense, land, sea, air defense. This is a good question, actually, because there's common misconceptions. Um, 
usually people going into this space try and treat it like a land, sea, or space kind of um, problem where they have clear, clear borders. Um, they can say, okay, well, this server is based in Norway, so um, anything that happens on the server, it's Norway's fault. Um, that goes the same for you know, cloud services or business servers. Um, whereas at the end of the day, you can't think of things like in the physical sense of where something is physically, but you have to think of it um, more as a ecosystem that crosses borders and, um, and crosses physical systems as well. Can I build off? Yeah. That's, that's, and so, and it's, it's a really important point because I think a lot of times when we think about cybersecurity defense, we really are trying, we, we take these models from previous decades and try and plop them onto the cyber domain, and it's really, really ineffective. And so we see it here all the time, you know, we're in a Cold War 2.0, sort of analogies like that that really actually limit our ability to innovate and think broader about what's going on. Um, and so by doing that, by, by putting, you know, cyber is now in the fifth domain in the military, and so by putting it there, it, in many cases, while it's good to highlight what's going on, it also makes it, it transfers every single analogy from those other areas and puts them in there versus thinking about it as something really new in, you know, something that in an area that we really have not understood, you know, very much. You know, it's, it's pretty much one of the first areas that you know, humans have made, but we don't really understand how it all works or what some of the repercussions are going to be uh, on the, from societal areas, how the technology is going to um, expand. And so I think, you know, I think, Sophia, you're absolutely right that it's, it's really, really problematic when you try and just transfer one for one. doesn't mean we don't build out, you know, you know, we don't learn from the other areas. You absolutely should. We also need to understand what the differences are and then start to explore those. One legal example of this actually is the reliance on Title 10 and Title 50 um, from a political perspective, where we try and apply those to defense and offensive situations in cyber, but those don't necessarily apply, right? So you could do something that's defensive that's technically not on your network or technically um, on a public internet space and that um, from a physical standpoint would fall under Title 50, but maybe it should fall under Title 10 or maybe neither. Um, so those sort of things need to be re reassessed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly from a, a legal standpoint, with respect to legal doctrines, we see a lot of the, um, the sort of trends you're talking about, which is sometimes when these cases are before the courts, you'll have judges who are looking at sort of traditional legal doctrines and trying to apply the brick and mortar doctrine into the cyber context. And, and most times it's not a perfect fit, sometimes it's not even a good fit. But we see courts right now struggling with how they should borrow from doctrines and if they should borrow from doctrines, and if so, which doctrines. And, and there are multiple sort of lines of case law that might be, might be applicable. Um, you know, in, in the commercial law context, you see breach of contract theories, you see tort theories. Um, and I think that where we are with legal doctrines hasn't, hasn't quite sorted itself out yet. But you do see judges sort of looking for analogies in prior case law and prior doctrines, and the reality is those may need to be updated, adjusted, or you know, abandoned in, in light of new legal doctrines that apply in, in the cyber context. I think an interesting example of that was issue a few years ago where, where Google ser servers were in Europe, right? Um, with, what's that called again? The <laughs> um, GDPR. GDPR, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, basically they could say, well, our servers are physically located in, um, you know, country X, but someone from Germany might be accessing them. So what do you do in that situation? Another example of that, I think, is in, uh, well, some misguided um, uh, desires to, like, be responsive to cyber attacks by, you know, responding you know, in a similar way back to the perceived um, attributed um, company or, or country. Um, and, and similarly, it's like if you were hacked by, by a, uh, and even if you had the ability to do a good attribution, which I think is questionable for a lot of companies, but if you were to be able to attribute definitively that it's a, comp a certain country that attacked you, and you think about kind of hacking back or like, you know, responding with the same force and if they use like a botnet of IoT devices to come after you, like are you gonna go after those IoT devices that are like in consumers' homes that, um, and, and where you know, this idea of responding in kind like doesn't make sense because there's going to be so much uh, collateral damage there and your ability to actually attribute who owns what and what device and what was actually responsible is probably um, limited. So let me, let me offer a, a thought that, that follows on that, because I think you're both dead on. Uh, I think we have an obligation as cyber defenders to actually educate 
and I think that that is often lost. Um, just think about the negligence arena from a legal perspective, right? I mean, there's a standard of care for many things, right? Legal malpractice, medical malpractice, et cetera. And if we could assist the judiciary around the world in thinking about what every single expert in cyber or in global security thinks about, right? You just heard Melody go through a list of basics, and then there's customization. But there is a foundation. What if that became the standard of care, and then you look, as you do in every other legal negligence arena, at the circumstances in that particular event at that particular time? That hasn't happened yet, and the cases that I've seen, um, and, and remember, I don't follow the, the cases all that regularly. I stopped being a lawyer about uh, almost 20 years ago, and I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I get to talk technical now. Um, and the, the reality is that we need to help, right? We need to be at the table. So part of my role, for example, is outward facing. So I spend lots of times with global government leaders um, thinking through what some of that basic hygiene should look at like, number one, but also thinking about Sophia hit on something we could debate probably all day, and I'm sure others will. Did GDPR actually help anything? I'm going to leave you with, to ponder that question. <laughs> Edna, you raise a great point about the, the basic hygiene, right? And we started this with Melody and the idea that there are some basic things that uh, most, if not all, companies can do. And I'd like you to expand a little bit more to bring you back to your legal roots about that and this idea of what is reasonable, right? So how does a company or how should a company, how can a company think about the idea of reasonableness and what's reasonable for that company as they are thinking about their cybersecurity posture in potential litigation? Uh, so, so that's a question that could be a whole course, quite frankly. <laughs> but I, I think it comes back to the reality of the circumstances. So uh, when you heard Melody speak, she spoke about the, the perspective of somebody who is protecting incredibly valuable assets in a variety of forms that, quite frankly, are very different and deserve a different degree of protection. When you look at me, we have, uh, so I, we have a CISO um, who is very closely involved in protecting our network. You can imagine with Cisco and the way we're ubiquitously deployed. Um, the, you know, I sat on the plane about six weeks ago um, and I was in, i uh, tell you a little story, I was in the window seat and he was in, this gentleman was in the aisle seat and there was somebody in the middle and he spent the entire time explaining why he was wearing proud Cisco hacker on his hat. Um, and it was a glaring example of the need for physical security and awareness of your surroundings because I sat there blissfully listening, um, <laughs> and happily taking some notes. And, and he had no bloody clue who was in the window seat. So yeah, I think the, the reality is it depends on who you are. We're an OEM as well, right? So our CISO is protecting our network. Now think about an overlay. We have solutions that are hardware, that are software, and some are cloud-based. Mm -hmm. The cloud is not a pure Cisco cloud, it's a hybrid cloud. So now, we, the two of us have to think together about, that's fantastic that you were doing that, and you're using Cisco products, and you're using third-party products, hooray. So I believe you're using third-party CSPs who are forming the foundation of our IAAS and our SAAS and everything else that you can bring to bear in the cloud environment. What are we doing to evaluate them? Now imagine that some of them are megaliths. Imagine having a negotiation or a discussion with Amazon about AWS's infrastructure capability and security and what they may or may not share. That takes an understanding of partnerships, of risk-based approach, uh, I, I think we need to change the paradigm a little bit and say we need to sit down. This is the number one cross-functional area. You need folks who have different skill sets and you need to make sure that your architectural approach is not a singular, narrow, all computer scientists, all information security all the time, because guess what? Somebody might be sitting next to you on a plane while your mouth is moving, and there's no cyber involved in that, but there's lots of learning. So, Andrea, I want to go to you. We've talked a little bit about the theory of cyber defense. We've talked about basic hygiene versus company-specific 
um, or business specific risk and managing that risk. Can you talk to us about some of the key strategies that uh, can be employed with respect to cyber defense? Sure, and that's um, even that, that could be a broad question as far as different organizations versus governments, mm -hmm. um, individuals as well. So I think depending on who you are, and that's you know, one of the big tenets in you know, international relations where you, you where you, where you stand depends on where you sit, and so your cyber defense strategy is going to be very similar to that. Um, but sort of thinking you know, broadly, you know, there is that, there, there's the technical element, obviously, we talked about you know, moving beyond the perimeter, and with IoT, um, bring your own device to work, all those kind of things. You, organizations really do need to think much more broadly in, in that area and how to defend, but at the same time, prioritizing, and that's where sort of the, you know, sort of the, the risk analysis comes into play, because you, not everything matters, right? So, you know, a, a DDoS that may take down your website, depending on who you are, may or may not matter as much to a company, right? And so you need to start prioritizing what, you know, what kind of attack, is, you know, do you need to defend against the most? What, where is your most important data? Um, timeliness of response. And so a lot of the, the strategies moving forward, the ones that you see that are, the defenses that are doing pretty well, especially if, if you think um, after a breach, are those that combine both at some of the technical aspects, such as you know, data segmentation, um, the encryption that we've talked about, have had, sort of have had employed the smart aspects of the cyber hygiene, but they also take in the human element as far as the, the PR, the communication, and the legal, and that's where a lot of that all comes into play uh, to make sure there's a, you know, a common theme in responsiveness. Because you can look at some of the different companies after some of the major breaches, and there's you know, the reason why some of them have taken a big hit uh, in the stocks or, or, or you know, in reputation you know, a lot of that comes back down to the response versus actually even what happened to some of the data. And so it's interesting in, in that regard as well. Um, but just one more thing I, I would add on the human element, almost thinking more at the individual, is you know, ensuring that whatever cyber defense you know, companies pursue or individuals pursue fits within the, the normal business <coughs> and workflow. Otherwise, the, individual, the employees aren't gonna follow it. And so you can think about you know, you know, phishing attempts, for instance, or you know, those are one of, the, one of the most prominent ways to, to compromise into a network. Um, but a lot of companies, either they aren't training on that or if they're training on it, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty much, you know, click through a PowerPoint slide and, uh, you know, that, that doesn't do the education aspect of it. Um, so it has to fit into the normal workflow. And even then the education aspect also has to come into play. And you think about, like with Gmail, you know, there was a, you know, someone from Google was speaking earlier this year and it's only about 10% of Gmail users use two-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. And so which gets back to the, you know, our, our job as security is to educate. And we're doing, I'd argue, a really poor job educating people as to even some of the more, most basic elements as far as why they need to do it and what the benefit of it is, and then making sure it works within a user experience that, that they're comfortable with. Because I was even on a, I was in a panel you know, with the Defense Department area and talking about you know, two-factor authentication on Gmail, and like, oh, well, it's just too hard. <laughs> oh, but it's, it's not, though, really. But if that's, if that's the perception, perception's what matters, right? Okay. And so you have to keep, I mean, that's why the, the cyber defense start tries, they, it is hard. I and mean, that's part of the reason why you know, we're all up here and hopefully more and more people come into the industries. It's a really hard challenge that is working within a socio-technical field um, and we do need the diverse perspectives coming in and the strategies do need to be um, honed for each individual and each organization and, and where they are. Mm -hmm. well, I have a good to a face story which by the coup of my life was getting uh, Ryan Reynolds as part of Deadpool 2 production to mandate that everyone use 2FA um, <laughs> in the uh, protection of systems and you know that's one thing I, I work a lot in Hollywood um, and these are personalities uh, who have workflows that they believe are perfect um, and cannot be disrupted and I, I'm a really big believer that like we need to meet people where they are, and it's our job as defenders to give tools and capabilities to users that are fundamentally secure and allow them to do the best work. And I think there's a lot of, um, there's like, so from, my, from my take then, it's like, well, what are like the non-negotiables? And like things like 2FA, I actually think through training, through like things like YubiKeys, which I think really kind of enhance uh, usability um, of 2FA, you know, we can get there. And then there's other things which, you know, like I wouldn't force, you know, it would be insane to kind of to try to force James Cameron to use like a shitty document, ma sorry, document <laughs> management system um, that, you know, is really painful and, you know, is hard, is, has bad usability as opposed to like, if he loves Dropbox, like great, like I'm psyched you should use Dropbox. Um, so I think there's, um, there's a, I think there's, in some sense it's like letting go a little bit of control, which I think is important. Um, to, so then you can like, when you do want to come down on something, you have really strong confidence around something like 2FA, you can have a lot more standing, you know, because I don't fight them on every little thing. I let nine things go and then come down on the 10th, like, all right, she really cares about this. Um, and I, I think that's, 
particularly working with creatives, which is who I work with, like that's mm -hmm. how we do that education and that piece is by, you know, being very firm on a few things and then pretty permissive against a set of other things and really trying to provide secure by default platforms that people still love and which is one reason we push a lot of SaaS, you know, because a lot of SaaS platforms are consumer grade, people like using them. And I think they're, they, they have fundamental security that's better probably than something we could roll ourselves. So let me, let me uh, feed off of that if I could for a minute. So I think you said something that's very important that, that certainly I believe in, which is, and if you think engineers don't think that they're creative, let me clue you in, they surely do. And in fact, they really are. Um, creative perhaps in a different way, but mind-bogglingly innovative. Um, so you don't want to stifle, Melody doesn't want to stifle the creatives that she works with. I don't want to stifle the innovation, right? I mean, right now, I have a big uh, set of investigations going on because I live and die uh, by the belief that none of us still to this day, if you all take a nice deep breath or you take a sip of whatever beverage you have, you are not experiencing the digital environment. Sorry, you're not. You're still experiencing it through a three-dimensional, tangible device. What's the heartbeat of the device, the PCBA? What's the heartbeat and brain of the PCBA? The integrated circuit. Where do I want to spend my time? I want to spend my time in the, inside the logic of chips. That's where I love to be. Um, all right, I'm weird, I got it. <laughs> but, but the reality is, if I can use crazy things like derived polynomial expressions inside of a chip that give me a flag, because I also live in the world that everybody on this panel lives in, the real world, where we are not preventing everything Right, so you all know rule number one is when the person walks in the door and sells you something for security and says, I can give you a guarantee, run. Run <laughs> for the hills and don't look back. Um, but, but those things are things that are examples. What Melody just said that was critical is flexibility. So I have a fundamental architecture that's really elastic. I set goals, none of us wanna say the how. In fact, if you want some of, some of my engineers love biometrics. They love their eyes. They love their <laughs> fingerprints. <laughs> Fabulous. Use that. Some of them want to use Ping ID. Some of them want to use YubiKeys. I hate YubiKeys. They're a pain in the neck because I travel constantly. I'm an example of flexibility. I'm not going to use the YubiKey. I'm going to use Ping ID. This is my lifeline. This is next to me. I sleep with this. My husband <laughs> loves this device. <laughs> <laughs> but there's the reality. There's, there's a goal in your architecture, and there are multiple ways to achieve it. Our journey is to drive the end game while allowing the flexibility on the methodology utilized to allow folks to use the goal, get, reach the goal, and use what they want to get there, but ensure they're getting there. Melody, I think that's where you and I agree adamantly. Yeah, well, and I mean, I think, you know, what, what I'm hearing is some of the, um, First of all, the practicalities of a potentially very cyber secure system, you know, sort of meeting, you know, it's where the rubber meets the road of the, the end user and what it means and um, finding or training through perhaps uh, perceived trade-offs between convenience and security, right? Uh, so sometimes it's a matter of just training through it to say, no, this is what we're going to do now and here's why and I need everybody on board. That might mean picking your battles, as Melody points out, which is, right, like there are some things that are going to become baseline that we need everyone to adjust to and then there are other places where our system needs to flex um, in order to make it practical because even if you have the most secure option, if people don't exercise it, then it's not, not really helping you. Um, uh, on that note, I want to, I want actually everybody on the panel, and, and Sophia will start at your end and come back this way, to talk about the idea of offense as defense. This is something that is um, kind of a, a popular issue now in the cyber defense world. You know, I think for a long time we operated under the no hack back uh, rule or idea or concept, and now we have legislation introduced that would allow companies uh, limited, for limited purposes to uh, take uh, arguably offensive actions in response to a cyber incident. And I would just love to get each of the panelists' reactions about the, um, the idea of active defense and the possibility of a hackback or something short of a hackback. So I think there's two different ways to look at this. <clears throat> First, with the law, um, I think majority of support for that law became um, about just because First of all, the problem of attribution. So potentially, if you can do an offensive action or what's classified as an offensive action, you have 
you will be able to gain more information to attribute the hack that hurt you in your business. Um, second, though, is the matter of IP theft and the issues surrounding that. And so um, there's some thought around if you could hack back the person who stole your IP, maybe you could delete that IP or um, somehow get in a situation where they'd be incentivized not to use your IP. Um, so I think that's what's driving the force of that law. Um, but from an other standpoint, just using offensive means to solve security issues, one common example of that's fuzzing, right? Or um, auditing program to look for, for bugs, right? So a lot of times commercial products have third party software in them. Um, sometimes that third party software is given to you without source. Um, but you want to make sure that your device or software that you're building is safe. So you'd want to um, look for bugs in that or you know, do some sort of thing that could be classified as offensive, but um, with the end goal of ensuring that your product or software is safe that you're selling to consumers. So. Melody, any thoughts? Uh, I think that's actually a very nuanced take on it, um, <laughs> as opposed to I think what a lot of the discussion is. Uh, the I mean, my take is like I, I generally don't think companies should be in the business of uh, uh, retribution. Um, oh, I agree with that so, too. I just yes, want to put yeah. that out there. Yeah, so, it's a bad <laughs> idea. Yeah. It's not going to end well for anyone. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think a lot of these. I think some of it is what alludes to what Andrew was saying earlier about trying to apply. Uh, analogies from other domains and seeing if they're appropriate. I think this is a case where the people formulating the laws uh, could maybe benefit from uh, you know, other representation in the conversation of technical points of view around the actual difficulties of, not only the difficulties of being able to do it well from an attribution and then uh, you know, a commensurate response perspective, but also just like the wisdom of like, what we'd be unleashing um, by pursuing this as a policy. Yeah, it could be an escal escalatory act, for instance, which would be awful. Um, or you could mess it up somehow, which is probably what would happen, yeah. uh, and do something else damaging, so. Yeah, and I'd say this is one of the areas that, so not, you know, I was talking about you know, problems going back to the Cold War. This, some of these discussions go back to about the 1300s, and they talk about the letters of Mark. And so that's some of the justifications they use that as far as, well, you know, we were able to get privateers out there and go get, you know, go get you know, booty back from, some, from the ships, and the pirates worked well. And uh, there are numerous issues with that we can talk about after, if we want, for during, during Q&A. But I think a lot, of the, um, a lot of the reason why there's been this, this growing focus on the policy front, I think, is, is stemming from corporations' frustration with the government not doing that much in response. And so there is some understandable frustration there. Um, policy has been extraordinarily slow uh, to, to innovate and modernize. I mean, if you look at like, the, the Computer Fraud Abuse Act you know, from the mid-'80s, right? So we're several decades into this. Um, we still haven't modernized in, in various areas. And so there is some that, that frustration. Um, at the same time, I do, it, I'll, I'll agree with them, I, I think it's really, really extraordinarily problematic to allow corporations to hack back. Um, one aspect, though, that I think gets kind of fuzz is the notion of hacking back, at least the way I think about it and when I research it and study it, it's more so talk about corporations, so it's it, hacking back is entering another network unauthorized. And so it's that unauthorized aspect of it. You can look around your own network as much as you want, that's, you know, that, that's fair game. Um, and these <coughs> policies that are coming out, the, the latest, you know, we finally have a national cyber strategy, which, you know, is, is nice to actually see. Um, DOD just put out their cyber uh, strategy as well. And so they're talking about defending forward, and so that's the, that's the terminology that they're using. And by that, that, that does you know, step away from their own networks and, and, and they need to say you're know, attacking, you're know, hitting the, you know, the attacker outside of their own networks. Um, and I think it's different when it's the government doing that um, for a variety of reasons, which again, I don't think this is something, the, you know, the gloves aren't off, because that's also been a discussion that's going on. I think there's still you know, a decent amount of constraints. There's, cause for concern that some of those constraints are going away. But at the same time, the government should be able to, when they've got some of the data, when they've got the, the capabilities, um, and, you know, they've gone through whatever legal aspects they need to go through. You know, it is, the defending forward, I think, does make more sense, which is, to me is very, very different from the hacking back um, and allowing corporations to do that. Um, the, the law that's going through in the ACDC, that's going through Congress, or has actually been kind of stalled in Congress, I think, for over a year. It's been like in three different iterations of it. Um, is more so focused on co corporations, and so that's the one that, that, that does concern me a lot. But I'm not as concerned about the defending forward, assuming there's, um, 
the reasonable steps that are taken as, as they should be. Can you talk about the difference between hack back and defending forward and where that line is? Yeah, well, to me, the line is who's doing it. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the defending forward is, is the government. Um, and specifically within, you know, within currently, uh, the DOD, the, Depart the Defense Department would be the ones. Um, whether that extends into the intel community, I think that, that's also where part of the discussion where, we, from what I've seen, is not extraordinarily clear yet. Um, so if, it, if those kind of capabilities expand, that does concern me a little bit more, especially given you know, there's different access to data, there's different knowledge, there's different concern about the, you know, the potential escalatory effects of it. Because um, that's one reason on the corporate on the corporate side why I, I get concerned is there's so much room for unintended escalatory effects with conflict between states that and that is really really concerning to me. Um, and at the same time, especially for these corporations, we, we look at how long it takes for even a breach to be found, and, and generally it's you know over 100 days. You, every study shows something a little bit different. Um, you're not going to get your data back even if you hack back <laughs> as a corporation, I, I mean, unless I mean it would be shocking, right? They, that they only kept that one that one copy of the data, um, if that's what you're trying to get at. Um, or if you're, if you're just trying to go and retaliate, then that also has the <laughs> escalatory effects. I'm not sure that you know, corporations shouldn't be involved in making those kind of strategic policy decisions uh, across borders. I think that um, makes that problem of IP theft really hard, too, yep. just given digital copies of things. Absolutely. Sort of yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and then going back to the defending forward, I, I do think it, it, it still is going into you know, external networks, but it is, it's the, currently it would be the, defenders, the government defenders doing it. Mm -hmm. And in theory, you're know, trying to also stop it before it hits a certain corporation or hits our government. Mm -hmm. So it's more proactive. Um, but that still, there, there are a lot of nuances there that need to be worked out. I mean, that just came out uh, you really within, about last, within the last month. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more discussion that needs to be held there. It shouldn't just be, um, shouldn't just be assumed the gloves are off, but it shouldn't be ignored as well for something I think, I think it's going to be instrumental going forward, so there needs to be a lot more discussion going on as far as exactly where the, the lines are. Edna, your thoughts on hackback, active defense? So Cisco, since its existence, has been in the business of changing the way people work, live, play, and learn. Nowhere in there is there changing the way people attack one another. I think that is the business of government. We have the privilege of living in a democracy, uh, and I think that is a clear and unambiguous position. I think each of the other panelists have mentioned the difficulty as well with attribution. Uh, it is not easy, um, and I'd encourage all of you, if you want to get a good laugh, for five years, Ted has been asking me to do a TED Talk, and I said, I, I can't do a TED Talk because I speak like a corporate person. Um, I do not speak like a regular person, um, and uh, you don't want me up there, and so I just, I did one, um, and you should go look at it, and I, trust me, get, get a glass of water, because you'll be laughing really hard. Um, it's out on YouTube, and here's my problem, because this is a real story. You know, we're getting ready to enter critical uh, infrastructure month. We're in week three of cybersecurity month. We're talking about critical infrastructure in a world where IT and OT is converged and you live in a democracy and you're trying to assess attribution. Let me ask you this question. Is my 11 year old whiz kid neighbor who shut down my other neighbor's freezer for three days somebody who you want to attack back on? And could that personal individual hacker in a world of convergence, utilizing either an IIoT or just a plain old-fashioned toaster or refrigerator or your thermostat uh, of choice. And by the way, nothing is connected in my house. Um, <laughs> uh, could they be a source of taking something down? And, and when you find that attribution route, are you really tracking it in a world where almost everything is becoming critical infrastructure? So ponder that. Really interesting and, and, and strong views here, which are nice to hear. A question for Melody and Edna on the hackback side. Do you see any value to this idea of being able to chase the forensic trail farther, right? So even if it doesn't involve going onto somebody's system and, and taking your information back or deleting it from their system, do you see any value in just being able to take that forensic investigation a step or two or three further than you can under the current rules? Uh, probably, but not. I don't think I should be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know we we cooperate with law enforcement and you know other partners regularly. We have 
um, you know, a, a variety of threats that rise to that level, and that's, I think, why we partner with the government. I think there's like a monopoly of force monopoly that you know, we respect there. And yeah, this I think of like, what are, what are we each like best suited to do? And it's like, I'd rather see the government focus on what it is uniquely positioned to do, which is, is monopoly on force, its ability to potentially push these boundaries in ways I don't even need to know about. Um, and then, you know, what, are, what am I, you know, uniquely suited to do, which is understand the risks of my business and, you know, defend it the way that I think is appropriate. And I'd rather the government not inform how I do that, um, and then I, in turn, won't inform how, you know, we should go after other companies from an offensive perspective. I think there's, like, a real, like, what, what do we each do best? And, like, let's try, to, we should cooperate, obviously, but then, you know, spend our actual <coughs> efforts on the things that um, we're best able to do. So. What she said. <laughs> uh, so, so I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I do think, uh, look, everybody loves forensic analysis because it leads to information. Uh, what you do with it is, is a whole nother question. Um, I think the, the solution is there are activities that private companies should not be engaged in, period. What we need to know is, is an ongoing debate in a number of classified environments uh, right now. Uh, and I think information sharing in a public-private partnership manner is something that we need to do a little bit better at. Um, and that gets back to something that should be, Michaela, near and dear to your heart, which is how can we encourage uh, better defensive strategy with information sharing that is free of retribution, fines, penalties, et cetera, because so many in the private sector would love to participate, but you can see reticence uh, in revealing things uh, because you're not quite sure what the liability might be from a governmental perspective. You're not quite sure what the liability might be from a customer given the absence right now of a standard of care for what is not negligence in a digital world. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think we have a little bit of a way to go, but I'm a big fan of public-private partnerships, speak honestly and openly, but I think uh, it's more difficult in the democracy that certainly I, I cherish uh, very dearly. Uh, the rules that make us democratic also prevent certain types of information being shared. Mm -hmm. So this is not an easy task. Uh, there is one group out there that is working on it right now, which is a public-private partnership. That's, that's about what I can say about that. Um, and uh, uh, we're struggling. I mean, we're struggling. I mean, you've only seen DHS issue a, a couple of uh, definitive orders. Uh, you saw it with Kaspersky. Uh, those are not common. Um, and there's lots of ramifications to what some could characterize as blackballing. One thing off that, just quickly, there's been initiatives over the past few years to create some sort of checklist um, to help ensure that companies follow certain things for minimum security. After that, you know, if they don't follow these and they're liable for any sort of at attacks after that point, then they kind of get off scot-free. Um, what you see happening is people, um, you know, the face value meet these requirements, but the spirit of security isn't there. Um, so it doesn't actually help from a defensive standpoint. Um, and this has actually spurred the market for uh, cyber insurance. That's a now huge area to go into. Um, so that just kind of builds off the point of we need some way to convince companies that there is value in adding security. You don't just have to um, you know, pay off any sort of attack that might happen, mm -hmm. which is kind of the de facto right now. Right, and finding the balance between risk mitigation and then ensuring over any residual risk or trying to ensure over residual risk that might exist. Uh, we talked a little bit about some specific, um, some specific strategies and some specific products, approaches to defense. We've talked about encryption. We've talked about two-factor authentication. We've talked about the use of the cloud. Uh, Andrea, I wanted to talk to you specifically about the idea of threat intelligence and the role of threat intelligence uh, in, in cyber defense. How much do you need to know about your adversary? What is this market like? I think there are a lot of companies that you know, will purport to sell you threat information, and some of them do. You know, how, what, what are your thoughts on that, um, and, and what are your ideas about the role of threat intelligence in, in a good defense? Yeah, so on the one hand, so you know, I have an analytic background, so I love having data and being able to analyze it. <laughs> so I'm going to say I love that. Um, at the same time, I think it also, it's, again, one of those, 
mean, security is just an industry full of overhype in so many different areas. And so on the one hand, you know, some of the data is really useful. There are companies, absolutely, that their entire job is to study and sell threat intelligence. Um, and some are going to be much better than others. And that's, you know, people can do their research in those areas. Um, but I do think, I think understanding the adversary is important. I know that um, there's pushback on that as far, especially you hear from the private sector, you're not really caring who attacks them, but just you know, wanting to get, get them out, which I think is a little bit too short-sighted, partly because you know, understand who's attacking you has certain uh, you know, tactics and techniques and procedures that they use, and so they could be using those again, they could be expanding. Um, there's certain actor, you know, threat groups that attack certain industries more so than others. And so by understanding you know, who might be attacking you through some of that threat intelligence, you can start learning about you know, and, and preparing your defenses accordingly versus having to defend against every kind of attacker. Um, at the same time, this is where it gets you know, really challenging, there also you know, are plenty of opportunistic attacks that are going on. So there's obviously the targeted ones, but you know, if you look at you know, the, the National um, Institutes of Health in, in the UK, are seeing the great example. You know, it, uh, they, they were hit by WannaCry, you know, like 20,000 appointments had to get canceled because of it. Um, you know, it ended up costing them, you know, over $100 million. They weren't the target. You know, they were, they were collateral damage in a geopolitical conflict. And so, protect, like, knowing the adversary in that regard probably wouldn't have helped them. And so that's where, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is really, really hard. So I think threat intelligence is really important, but it's not the end all be all. It's just, it's, again, it's one, one of those, you know, it's, it's just one of the, another tool in the tool belt mm -hmm. uh, in creating a, a broader defense. Um, but I do think it does enable more proactive defenses and does enable, um, you know, just, just understanding how to, you know, to get ahead of the attacker and, and see what's going on. And it also could, you know, in theory, you know, getting back to some of the information sharing, can also help different groups uh, share some information about what might be coming in or what's attacking certain industries. So it helps for you know, collaboration and, and, um, and so forth in that area as well. And so I do think it's important. It's not, I, I personally don't think it's the end all be all, but I do like having data to analyze. So Melody, we, Andrea spoke about a few sources of threat intelligence, right? One is like a subscription source or some kind of purchase of threat intelligence information. Another is an information sharing program that Edna was talking about where you can get information from the government or industry partners. And then you can also get information from your own network, just what you can see based on the threats that are that are you know that you're confronting every day. Do you have thoughts about other sources of intelligence or those three sources and how you use them as you approach your defense? Yeah, I have. Well, I'm very bearish generally on intelligence um, as a thing, as like as something that like I as a company would consume raw and be able to do something interesting with. Um, so like I don't think I subscribe to any threat intelligence feeds um, as part of my defenses. Um, we get some stuff from the government, uh, but the and that's useful. But the um, the way I, I think it's actually been useful and a shift that I've seen, which I really like, is you know cybersecurity vendors who are you know actually positioned in our network to do you know not just detection but also response in some cases, like leveraging intelligence into the platforms. And like, I think th these are companies that can be highly opinionated about what certain types of intelligence mean and have like the context to then be able to actually do that correlation against you know, what's, what our environment is expressing and uh, have an opinion on what to do. And so I think, I think there's something interesting for uh, security vendors who are obviously bringing intelligence into their products and that's, like, that's in our fleet, but I wouldn't like, you know, deal with lists of IOCs myself. I don't think there's like, much usefulness for me, at least as a defender there. Um, but I think, yeah, I think the companies, I, I appreciate the security research community and like the, the inputs that are then being baked into products and being baked into uh, they got our actual like underlying defenses. But it's less of like an analytic problem for, for me to do some correlation across many discrete data sources and see if this IOC hit me yesterday. And like that's, I don't think is a very useful exercise for us. Sophia, I want to talk uh, to you about scale and about differences that you see um, in security posture and defense between small organizations and large ones. And one distinction we talked about earlier is the idea of a basic cyber hygiene that, that most or many companies could employ versus business specific. Do you see differences in threats? Do you see differences in issues with respect to large and small companies? And you know, how, how, does that, how does that look in, in your perspective? Well, I think, you know, from one perspective, everything's just much easier when you have less people. Um, so, <laughs> it goes back to the human element that Edna yeah, was talking about. the human element there. Um, you, know, you can get everyone using the same two-factor auth. You can get everyone on the same VPN. You can get 
everyone to use, you know, to update their operating systems because you can go, you know, hit them over the head until they do it. Um, you know, and, and I think at, from that perspective, then you can allow more flexibility. Um, trail a bit, half, half the people are remote, but that doesn't mean that our security is any less than it would be if everyone was in person. Um, but then, you know, one issue that I always hear come up with people from larger companies is, you know, sure you have issues with people not following rules and that sort of thing, but the bigger issue is you don't know what servers you have because you have thousands of them and you forgot which ones are turned on because the person who quit two years ago forgot to enter it into a spreadsheet. Um, you know, you have servers running different operating systems, different versions, um, you know, one of them, you have to sit there with a keyboard plugged into the server to update it, and the other ones, you can maybe hook up to some automated system. Um, and so I think from that perspective, it's just a lot more of everything to deal with. I think it's also a function of you know, companies that have grown over time yes. versus you know, a company that starts cloud native. Because like mm -hmm. asset management, I think if you start today a company in Amazon for your infrastructure, you mm -hmm. kind of get all of asset management for free. You know, it's, it's yeah, like, outsource that problem. It, you know, it's actually like pretty straightforward. I mean, mm -hmm. with us, you know, we've grown since you know, black and white films. Uh, so there's just a lot, a lot of um, infrastructure, and it's and I think that problem that you like asset management ends up being actually extraordinarily complex. And that's why I'm, I'm bullish on some of like the core, um, like this core infrastructure choices that can be made today that can really abstract away so much of the complexity that you right. describe, um, but it's hard to kind of retrofit to a, mm -hmm. a, an organization that has, you know, been, um, you know, grown over uh, acquisition. But that's why I even, like, I push cloud transformation, you know, more than anything, you know, because- I think a lot of companies yeah. are hesitant, too, to outsource things. I mean, especially if some pe people in management are, um, you know, not familiar with using the cloud or not familiar with outsourcing two-factor off to some company. Um, they want to do everything in-house, so when you do everything in-house, um, you just kind of amass problems over time. Well, that's the other, actually, I think the tension between, like, the larger you yep. get, the more you're inclined to think that you're special and you should actually, that commercially available things don't apply yep. to you. Uh, it's like, a very large company is more likely to say, I should bring my own, build my own private cloud, right? Which, yep. like, no startup is going to say, I should build my own private cloud. Really, no one should build their private cloud, in my opinion. <laughs> but, you know, I think the, the more, the bigger you get, the more unique you think you are. And then the mm -hmm. more you think you need to roll your own everything. Whereas, really, like, for me, we, for example, use Dropbox as our, you know, our enterprise grade, you know, docu document storage solution, which a lot of people think is totally insane. Um, but I think like, that is more secure than me trying to roll my own document management system. And I think like, yeah. there's some ego thing you have, you have to let go, I think, um, <laughs> to actually realize some of these commercial solutions are actually just good enough. Mm -hmm. I so, think on the flip side, though, some smaller companies might deal with issues of just not being able to afford or justify getting like the nice cloud service provider or something like that. That's true. So, so two thoughts. Um, one, I, I think I want to dispel the notion that if you're small, uh, that means it's easier. Um, it means you're not paying attention to your third-party ecosystem, right? So the, the latest surveys, uh, uh, without mentioning names, uh, reveal uh, this past year that 74% of those attacks that could be attributed were attributed to third parties. Um, if you look at uh, the company that puts out its annual cyber incident report. Uh, I did an analysis over the last eight years. Uh, we're not moving the needle. 75 to 80 percent of the problems are coming from third parties. That's been consistent for eight years. You could argue we're doing better because obviously the denominator is growing as we go more digital. All right, I'll give you that math credit. But the reality is it's 75 to 80 percent. Anybody happy with the 75 to 80 percent? Of course not. If I could t look at you and say, uh, solve this problem, third parties, and you will, uh, you will reach 75 to 80% of the problem, where would you spend some resources? Amazingly enough, people are not aware of the third party ecosystem. It's just coming out now, to which some of us want to say, where have you been for the last 30 years? Um, and I think the last piece is, even in our own uh, annual cybersecurity report, to Melody's point, you know, in, the, in the course of outsourcing, and I, and I too think that you know, hybrid clouds and public clouds are good things if you know what's going on, recognize that you have some capacity to investigate. So 
Imagine, for example, there might be a company out there that also uses Box, but they might have gone to Box and said, hmm, we don't like what you're doing there, so can you do this, this, and this, and beef that up? That's the beauty of partnership in a digital economy. And you know what happens is you not only make it better for yourself, you make it better for your provider, and you make it better for everybody else who's using it. That is a huge win, and it's not a public-private partnership, and it's not a big information sharing, um, but there is, a, there is a win there. Uh, I totally agree with that. I looked at it yesterday, and I realized I've submitted 15 future requests to Okta that are associated with my name, um, and I luckily can you know, try to get those escalated. But I think it's really important. Like These products are only going to get better as the result of customers telling them that they actually, there's features that are important. And so we're going to box drop, you know, we're, we're providing those kind of features requests all the time. Um, but again, they're going to be able to scale and build that faster than we could build. And so I totally agree. Yeah, so look, let me make a, let me make a completely sexist comment. Um, but this is the audience to make it. And I'll try to be as careful as I can because I see a big camera recording this over there. But for those of us who are, you know, sitting up here, as a general rule, we have a very small amount of testosterone running through our bodies. Um, as a result of that, we just think differently. It doesn't mean that all women play well, trust me. You, you, you don't get to be 61 years old and not have figured that out. We were just talking about that this morning. But we do better together. Bloody hell, we do better together. Bring that view, bring your unique perspective to the table, and all of a sudden, together means something very different when women are at the table, really different. In my case, my maiden name is Pizzoni. It generally means you're gonna get some kind of lasagna <laughs> or a cannoli, <laughs> but there's a lot less arguing. Um, there's heated debate and very strong positions. Not every woman on this panel agrees with everything. Um, but I think that's a really important piece in a digital economy. You are connected to everybody else. This is our chance to not only drive security, but bloody hell, we can change the world while we're at it. This reminds me of the, you know, the ego problem. That was a huge issue you know, early on when software was getting big. Um, bug bounties, if you submitted a bug, you'd be you know, hit with a you know, fine or a lawyer's letter or something. Um, and you know, now we've reached the point where some companies are, you know, welcome people to submit bugs. Um, they have a program for it, they'll pay you some money. We'll pay for it. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, but yeah, just the simple act of starting to accept people telling you, like, oh, this is broken, or there's a security flaw here. Um, like, that was a huge, huge move in the right direction, I think, for the industry. Yeah, and I want to follow up, Edna, with the points you were making about the third-party ecosystem. One thing we see on the legal side that's happening is the um, uh, the fact that people and companies are paying a lot more attention to the contracts they have with third-party vendors in the digital space, and that is true whether it is a product they are purchasing or whether a vendor gets access to their network or, or pieces of their data because of the kind of work they're going to do. And so some of the issues you're trying to talk about with this you know, partnership that's just two parties. You don't need a huge information-sharing mechanism. You you don't need a government involved. You can have two private companies come together and th as a matter of a contract negotiation, uh, improve security on one side and, and possibly a product on the other. Um, there are lots of factors baked into that to include relative bargaining power, right? And I imagine you, know, you and Melody both come to the table with, with some bargaining power when you do that. So it's probably a little bit different for some of the smaller companies that Sophia was talking about. But um, con contract and contract negotiation is one way to just take baby steps in terms of improving security on individual transactions, individual products, et cetera. So yeah, I do think you can go that route. I, I have a, a particular bias. Uh, it is mine. Um, it is that contracts shift risk. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't drive security. And, and what I'd like to do is drive security. So you know, it may be, it may be a reason why you know, I, I started my career prosecuting homicide cases. And you, you need to be present in the courtroom for those circumstances. In the commercial arena, if you're in the courtroom discussing something, you've already lost. You've already lost. You're wasting money, you're wasting time, and all you're doing is debating about who's going to hurt who more and who's going to pay for it. Um, and this doesn't mean there isn't a good you know, reason for that, but the reality is a combination of the contract with maybe a, a nice architecture, a set of requirements, a business practice that's flexible 
is in my opinion a better route mm -hmm. and then holding people accountable and, and you're right um, I think market clout matters but let me give you an example so the value chain uh, for us at Cisco is very diverse right it starts with design and develop it's, it moves through all the traditional nodes of a supply chain and includes sustainment um, and it also includes end of life so we deliver probably 86, 90 percent of our solutions through a third-party channel. Do you think I have market cloud at all with the channel? I'm actually beholden to them to move my products and my solutions rather than my competitors. Mm -hmm. So when you had to sit at the table and say, by the way, I'd like to talk to you about my 11 domain architecture and the 156 requirements that we're going to chat about, not going to work, right? Because you're just too difficult to work with. So then the question becomes, what are the foundations? What are the fundamentals? And how can you align with your colleagues and say, what can we ask for that is that foundation together? And what can we point them to that might help them as well, right? So, you know, it's, there's a lot of books on, you know, we've all read them, right? If, you, if I see win-win one more time, I've seen one that's win-win-win. I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> there's a Roman Catholic. If I ever saw one, it must be, you know, the... the the Roman Catholic view of three, and I am Roman Catholic, so I get to say that. But um, it, it is—it's an interesting phenomenon. Talking about it and actually doing it is really hard work, um, and sometimes it's a contract negotiation where you look at your legal team and you say, "Nope, not going to put it in the contract. I'm going to say we're going to agree to a course of conduct." And, you can imagine some folks in the legal department might have a view on that and say, well, that's fabulous. There's nothing binding there. I'm like, yep, that's the path we're going to walk. Let's see how it works. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a balance, right? Mm -hmm. there, there were all these tools in the toolkit that you get to use, but boy, you don't use all of them at the same time um, with the same party. Mm -hmm. it, it's a great point. And contracts, uh, you know, at, at their most basic level do shift risk, which uh, in, in many cases will then change the incentive of the parties, right? And change the incentive of how to work or could change the incentive of the parties. Or at least if it doesn't change the incentive of the parties, uh, can, can allocate any losses, right, a certain way, uh, which, which may mean that in the event of an incident that you're, you're differently situated than you would otherwise be. Uh, we have a few minutes left. In order to leave enough time for questions, I'm going to do one more, one more question for the panel and then we'll open it up. But uh, I, I'd like to end with the idea about what's next. What's next in cyber defense? What's the next thing that people are talking about? What are you thinking about? Um, and what's the thing that's you know, around the corner that we haven't talked about yet on the panel? And I'll start with Sophia. We'll come back this way. <laughs> no, no time to think. Um, so I think that the major things we'll see in the next coming years, or in the coming years, is just more use of third-party systems, um, more data that's either shared or um, held by multiple parties at once. Um, the model of just one company holding, you know, your credit card number for you inside of the walls of its buildings, you know, that's gone, right? Um, so I just think we'll be seeing more and more of that. I think the, the one thing I'm thinking about the most for the future is really just like the concept of identity, um, kind of in a world where kind of all PII is out in the wild um, and the being able to identity proof someone um, is going to be increasingly difficult. It's like what are the new models for um, identity proofing and uh, being able to confirm someone is who they say they are, both from a consumer perspective, like interacting with our products as well as our employees. And I think it's more important um, given, like we, we talked about the, the trend of kind of perimeterless world, but if you're gonna be pushing, you know, security like to the application, to the device, you know, like identity becomes like essentially the central control plane through which you do security. And if you don't have fidelity to be able to confirm that someone is who they say they are because they have password reset questions, for example, that have information that's publicly available on the internet about me, um, like that's a problem. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about identity, and I think there's a lot of interesting innovation um, from core technology providers about, you know, how to identity proof. I'll take it up to a strategic level. Um, so looking across the globe, there's a lot of data localization laws coming into play, and so while on the one hand, you know, there, there are no borders on the internet, uh, there increasingly are borders when it comes to uh, data localization, privacy laws, um, government access to data, all those kind of things. And so going back to Anna's point on the, the currency of trust, um, I think trust and data protection are going to be increasingly essential in 
how different governments are already dealing with it. And that's where we're seeing these two very divergent paths going on right now. And so you got the one, the one hand, you've got some of the data localization laws are, that basically mandate the government can access data uh, within the, on either its citizens or on servers that are located within their borders. Um, you know, China's really leading the way in trying to, to create those, those broader strategies. Um, and that model is diffusing to smaller states as well. And so that's spreading, I would argue, much faster than the individual data privacy that we're seeing, like the GDPR. And so at a high level, you know, there, there are definitely some issues with the GDPR that we could talk about, um, but they are a counter to this more government access to data model that's out there. And so we're gonna see you know, increasingly the, the, the battle between these two very, very different uh, visions of, of data, um, or of, how, of who should have access to data and how to protect the data. On the one hand, government access to data, another one, individual privacy and protection of individual data. And that has huge implications for democracy, civil liberties, human rights, all those aspects um, going on. So it's, it, it's already going on, and I think something just, I, I, that's something that I'm keeping a very tight eye on going forward, because then the defenses have to be thought about you know, how to defend against those, and then even doing business in some of those countries. I think there's gonna be start being that, that cost-benefit analysis that has to go on. So I think um, a couple of things. One, I think we're going to see a trend over time where people do come around to recognizing you need physical, logical, operational, behavioral, and information security tied together. So whether we change what the CISO does or we get to the point where we have CSOs who are managing the full spectrum of the aspects of security, I think we will see that grow over time, slowly. Um, I think we are also going to see a need for, and I'm hoping we're gonna see more companies grow to do this. I know at least of a couple of startups out there that are doing fantastic work on re-educating our population to be prepared to live in the digital world and to bring uh, cyber expertise to the table, whether you formerly were a uh, miner. Uh, in a mine, or you might have been in an industrial environment, or you might have been in healthcare. Um, there are folks who have phenomenal skills, um, and we need to translate them, and I'm hopeful that the U.S. will be first to do this, um, because everybody is aware of the talent shortage, and I think we all need to be educated. I think the third thing you're gonna see from a defense perspective is hopefully uh, those of us with voices, and you should all join, demanding that the education of our children be an education that actually prepare them to live in the digital world. We all teach our children to look both ways when they cross the street. Do we think about cyber hygiene in the same way? They should be starting right when they're growing up, before they're even in school. We don't really do that well right now. Um, and the last thing is I think we're gonna see more hardware to software architectural checks whether it's via hashes, whether it's via trusted boot, um, whether it's hardware anchors, um, because people are slowly figuring out that you don't breathe in software, and even if it's implanted in you, it's still a chip. Um, it's still digital but in, in its experience for you, but it's physical in how it manifests itself. Um, and that is the ticket to aligned security. Okay, great. Can I one point on it? Yeah. So a good example, I, I'm educating on the children, because that's super important, but. Um, sort of a, a good news story, which we don't always hear very often in security, so it's nice to hear. Um, so Fortnite, which you know, for any of us with kids, they, they play that a lot, um, more than we probably prefer them to. Um, so they did something recent where um, if, you know, if, you, if, the, if you install two-factor authentication to it, you get a free dance at the end. And I know that's not the right term, but um, you know, it was one of the, my son had, you know, didn't know exactly what was going on. He understood, though, if he did this you know, secure thing to do two-factor authentication, he'd get a free dance. And so he did it. Um, and all of his friends have done it. And so it gets into the incentive issue of how to incentivize good security. It even can be done for children. And so um, you know, Fortnite, which is actually is under you know, all sorts of different kinds of uh, you know, attacks, um, is a really interesting example of how to do something the right way to incentivize the users and help them protect themselves as well. Great. And so it's just create, it's thinking creatively and um, with a different mindset for how defense can, can occur. And I think that's a really interesting, interesting example of sort of thinking outside the box, um, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to educating children. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We're gonna open it up for questions. I see there's a microphone in the middle of the room, um, which you can make your way to, or you can just speak up and I'll try to repeat a question. There's a question in the back, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, that's good.
Hi, um, my name is Regina Joseph. Um, I'm an applied. Uh, I'm a researcher in applied scientific research um, dealing with human-computer interaction and quantified forecasting systems. And there were a couple of things that were raised on the panel with regards to some gender differences. And seeing as that there's a social scientist on the panel, I'm particularly interested in seeing how and whether people on the panel have considered the issue of confidence and overconfidence as a problem in cybersecurity. I run, um, uh, two weeks ago, I launched uh, in the Netherlands, not here, um, uh, the first public-private national program in identifying cyber threats. And so we've taken the top researchers, uh, uh, both public and private sector, top cybersecurity researchers, and now I'm putting them through a program of predictive accuracy. And one of those things is that we're testing their calibrated confidence in their prediction, in their predictive capacities. And one thing that's very clear is there are some gender differences in that type of behavior. So I'm curious to find out to what degree there's been actual thinking amongst the people on the panel within their, uh, within their programs and their companies about how to apply some of what we know about decision making and behavioral economics into their cybersecurity offensive and defensive strategies. Thank you. Andrea? Yeah, so I, I, I have not done the, the analysis break, breakdown by gender. Um, I think that would be fascinating to do. Um, one area where I've done a little bit of research, uh, we did a survey, was sort of the, the confidence gap between uh, executives and the more business executives versus the tech executives. <laughs> and so the business executives were, were pretty confident that they were doing everything they needed to, to have done. Whereas on the technical side, uh, especially when you went, went farther down into the practitioners, uh, they're like, no, 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 we, <laughs> there's so many concerns that we have. Um, so there's that gap there between the business and the technical side and confidence. Um, I haven't done anything as far as the, the, the gender aspect of it. Um, it would be interesting. On the one hand, it would it'd be somewhat challenging, at least within security, given that you know, there's about 10%, at least in the U.S., and it's not very different globally, you have know, women in the industry. And so it is a little bit of a challenge there, but I mean, obviously you can work, you can work around that. Um, I, I'd be, it would be interesting to, to, to explore that more, I mean, for, for sure. And I think there probably, I think there would be, I think there would be differences, yeah. It's just isn't an area that I, I don't focus much on, on the gender differences. Just anecdotally, I've noticed, um, just in years of doing technical work, that uh, there's a perceived level of confidence that's lower in women and higher in men, even if they might have the same level. Um, so it could just be the expression of it as well. What, one place where that, uh, where that could also be relevant, we were talking before about the hack, hack back, the idea of hack back and active defense. And to the extent that what, that is connected to uh, your level of confidence in your identification of, uh, of the threat actor, there could be a connection there, you know, regardless of gender, in terms of your level of confidence about your result and the actions you're willing to take. Um, there could also be a legal component to that. You know, if we saw laws that would allow a hack back at a reasonable level of certainty, for example, then whose reasonable level of certainty does that apply to and what does that look like, yeah, right? We're already tracking and correlating that, so, so, and with the hopes of building models on it. Okay, next question, thanks. Um, Ann Cox, Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. What is your opinion about the availability of commercial products versus the need for research and development of new <coughs> products? Is everything you need out there commercially and you just have to buy it, or do we still have gaps? So I'll get back to uh, Melody and Edna. <laughs> um, I, do, yeah, I believe there's a lot of opportunity for innovation um, and from a, from a research and uh, development perspective. Uh, so I don't think there's, uh, is, I don't think the problems have all been solved for sure. Um, I'd like, I, I guess you know, one way I think about it is like, I'm, I'm excited by companies that are like moving like a, I think there's like a trend right now for like where the research is going, at least I, as a buyer of technology, where you know, there's some things that are moving like upstream which I'm very bullish on, like actually you mean upstream in the problems, like identity providers who are thinking about security for identity proofing, for example, I think is, or even Microsoft, who's not my favorite, but you know, things they're doing around like Windows Hello or whatever, like, I, I'm excited to see like those kinds of pushes. And then there's like, the other, other research, which is like point solutions that are doing some things very well and solving very discrete problems like container security, which like just kind of opened a gap. And then there was like interesting research that, you know, came in to fill that gap. So I think that the problem set keeps, keeps changing. I'd like to see, you know, and I, I think that's kind of the, the, how I think about buying technology. It's like things that can either move very upstream or things that are solving like very specific problems that I have today, and those things are changing 
you know, every six months or every, you know, more than that. So, so yeah. So you're still buying new things. For sure. For sure. So uh, look, I think uh, the move by the government to, to go to COTS technology was prompted by the fact that we're a democracy and we spend money that are, come from the coffers of taxes and we're very sensitive to protecting our citizens' money and using it well. Um, uh, you know, there was a day, quite frankly, where innovation, I, so I'm, I'm looking around the room and I, I'm probably, not many remember this day, but there was a day when, when government actually did more innovation than the commercial sector. I think that's shifted, in, in all honesty. I think there's still a tremendous amount of innovation going on in the U.S. government. Uh, but I think there's a recognition that we're not there yet, and I think Melody hit the nail on the head when she said, by the way, it's always changing. So just when you think you've gotten there, you haven't gotten there because there's always something new being developed. Um, is there a place for specialized DOD uh, type environments that require specific warfighter configurations? Possibly, yes. That's why we have the DIB. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, the DHS uh, ICT Supply Chain Task Force, which is yet to be launched, but I'm told is about to be launched, that was announced in July, may, may look at this uh, comprehensively because you can't get to resilience unless you think about what's out there and what's not out there, both commercially as well as separately developed from the government. It's the best answer I can give you. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you do, by the way, at DHS. We need you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Christine Hanneman. I'm Information Security Specialist at First Republic Bank, also Research Associate for Security Women Organization. My question is uh, mostly for Melanie. Um, in terms of Fox News and your network, um, what would you say you're doing in terms of raising awareness um, for users in basic cybersecurity hygiene, also in terms of um, role models, uh, female role models in your shows? Uh, for example, a lot of the shows out there, you, you would see mostly there are males representing um, computers and technology and you know even uh, hacker shows and things like that. Uh, going forward, do you see that changing? And what would be your input in terms of um, maybe changing that movement, being a woman yourself, in, in terms of um, a high-profile network? Um. I think, there's a, a, I think there's something very interesting to getting public personas to talk about what they're doing for personal security. Uh, it's like the Ryan Reynolds example. Um, I've been approached by a lot of companies trying to get Ronald Reynolds now to talk about 2FA um, in public settings. Like I've been approached to like, you know, do marketing campaigns around this. Um, I think there's, it's hard because being a company talking about cybersecurity, there's, most companies are risk averse in that way because like you don't want to create a target on your back, and so I'm very hesitant to speak very publicly, you know, about my defenses, my defensive strategy. This is obviously a safe space, um, but uh, I think I, I'm interested in getting public personas, people on air. I work with people on air a lot, um, and getting them to talk about what they're doing. I think I think it'd be important, and I think this can, you know, extend to them what we can do for election security, what people should be doing, you know, as, as personal citizens in the world. And I think having public personas talk about their own personal security measures and the threats that they face would be a step in the right direction. I think we're not really close to that right now, um, but it, it's, it is something I work on. How about the uh, TV shows in terms of incorporating examples into like movies or you know regular shows and like for example um, the dance example like something like that like how would you engage like even kids um, is that yeah. something that would be uh, incorporated into the future like getting a network to incorporate that in you know it could be in a cartoon or like say for example Family Guy getting hacked or something like that you know right. like. I'd love to see a show about Sophia. I think that'd be rad. <laughs> um, I would watch that. Um, yeah, yeah. I think th I'd like to. Well, I'd like to see more shows about security generally. Um, and actually, I was at an event earlier this week that was at the the um, house where they were, like the evil the, the evil corp executive for Mr. Robot was murdered, and it was the pool. And I was like such a nerd. And I was taking all these photos and really excited about it. Um, and so I think I, Mr. Robot would be one example of this, but I think generally talking about this kind of skill set, there's like 8,000 versions of CSI. I think it'd be fun to have, mm -hmm. you know, more shows about security and like real life what that is, you know, so we're not still reliant on 
like watching sneakers or hackers or like some very, you know, dated movies that don't really represent what it is today to be a professional and that would get more people excited about the field. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I know you didn't ask me this question, but I'm going to answer anyway. <laughs> You know what I'd really love to see? Not a show about security. I'd love to see security embedded into yeah. sitcoms. Yeah, that's I'd what love I'm, to see I'm it embedded to, yeah. into the routine and ordinary core of what we watch every day, yeah. where we're looking at things that are funny, things about quality, things about uh, segregation, things about all the issues of the day, so security becomes sort of embedded rather than its own after the yes. fact and special area. Yeah, exactly, because not a lot of people will look at the show like Mr. Robot or, you know, um, you know, they're like, oh, that's for computer nerds or something like that. But, yeah, I mean, why know. doesn't Barbie's Fun House have a computer in it with, you know, a whole question <laughs> about wireless and, or using Ethernet? Exactly. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I, I see we have four more questions. What we're going to do is if you could each step up to the mic and ask your question, and then we're going to answer them all. So just go, you can go one at a time and just go all four in a row, and then we'll sort of field them. Uh, accordingly, so listen, we can listen to all four and people can ch kind of chime in. Please go ahead. All right. Hi, I'm Madison. Um, I, when we think about the future and what's right around the corner, I'd be interested to hear what you all think about AI and machine learning in cyber defense as kind of big industry buzzwords now. Okay, that's the first one, AI and machine learning. Hi. Um, I don't like two-factor authentication because I have four devices and trying to get Google to do that correctly was a pain. Um, and I don't have Alexa in my apartment, only in my boyfriend's apartment because I'm afraid of it listening to me. Uh, so, and I'm doing work calls at home. Um, so my, my question is what do you think are the technology gaps, that someone asked this question before, that could be solved to make these things easier to use and much more secure for consumers? Okay. The question about consumers and uh, technology gaps that need to be filled to make the use of basic security measures easier. Hi, my name is Alina Narditsky. I'm with IBM. And my question is also about the future. What do you think or what is being done to, I guess, lessen the value of the data that could be stolen? So rather than putting up bigger and thicker and stronger walls, I guess hiding things in plain sight. One of the examples that comes to mind, and I don't want to really bring this to the to currency, but Bitcoin and I guess that kind of encryption, which is obviously still very data heavy and data secure, but you can't really steal it by reaching into somebody's wallet or even stealing a number. We, we still live in a world where a nine digit number that's somewhere on a cardboard piece of paper in a drawer in my house, somebody can steal my entire identity with that. So what do you think is being done or could be done or are people even focusing on this, but to, to lessen the intrinsic value of the data and hide things in plain sight? Okay, next question. Uh, this is kind of left field. I'm a private investigator and you guys spoke about how you do um, cooperation with law enforcement when there's an incident. What do you guys do in house to deal with the back end of that information being stolen um, and then just dealing with the intricacies of um, backlash when it comes to it becoming public with, especially for Fox News, I could think of a few incidences and other companies. Um, do you have in-house people that do that or is it all purely law enforcement? Okay, thank you. So we have four questions. Anyone want to jump in? Um, I have responses to the first two. So <clears throat> I think AI machine learning um, does have a place, for sure. Um, right now, some of my current research is using machine learning to analyze programs automatically, uh, to look for security flaws. Um, I think it has been abused, too, in the past. Um, you know, the primary use of machine learning in security tools ends up being like as analytics for network traffic data. Um, so there's a lot more area for innovation there. Um, so second thing was about the technology gaps and making it easier for consumers to implement some cybersecurity So this measures. one is like really close to home for Trail of Bits. Uh, what, what we realize is, you know, simple like cryptography and just general um, secure channel, like network channels is very hard for people to make for themselves. So one thing we put out there was, is Elgo. Uh, it's a VPN that's free and it's really easy to set up. Um, and so little things like that doesn't have to, uh, cert bot uh, to get SSL certs on your servers. Um, that's also free, not trail of bits, but also free. 
Um, so things like that are emerging in the space that are really good. They do one thing, one thing really well, um, but it just makes it easier for people to get cryptography, get secure channels um, on their devices. So. Yeah, maybe I'll build on the usability question. I think about this quite a bit. Um, just because you know, we have you know, 30,000 employees, but then we have like 30,000 contractors. So we've had to think about how do we extend you know, security to people who aren't your full-time employees. Um, so friction becomes really important. These are like composers, right? So you're not gonna have the composer install this complicated VPN software, all these things. Um, so think about usability a lot. Um, and I think there's some, I, I've been excited to think, I think some basic things, I think like magic links that a lot of sites do now to like <laughs> automatically log you back into something that if you've not been logged in, I think that's like, that's been a good, like very high usability innovation, things like Slack do that. Um, I think generally like authenticator apps are also like have reduced a lot of friction and you know particularly things like Google Authenticator that you know allow things to be um, you know across platforms since so you can use the same app you know auth across many Duo platforms. Duo really innovated in that space. Sorry, uh, Duo, the company. Oh yeah, Duo. I think Duo, Duo does amazing. That work would be Cisco that now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great, great purchase. Um, but they, they had huge success, and it's all all because they didn't invent invent the technology they created, but they made it a hundred times easier for the average person to use. Yeah, totally. Which, you know, is basically like reinventing something. Duo. Duo. Well. And then the final one I talk about, I guess, like even password managers, which I think uh, essentially demystify making complex passwords. I know two passwords in my life, um, and that's a much easier place for humans to be. Um, and I think, you know, if we impose, uh, you know, complexity requirements on, I generally also believe that we should not be imposing complexity requirements. Um, we should have length requirements, um, and that makes things a lot easier too. So I think making passwords a lot easier actually solves a lot of things. And you know, one way is to make things about length, not complexity. Uh, and make it more passphrase based. And another is to actually just abstract away all of that, put things in a password manager. I think that helps. That's like one of the easiest like things to improve security. I think it's actually highly usable um, and makes uh, security easier. It actually lowers friction. It's kind of a win-win-win in -win -win mm -hmm. those <laughs> Uh, Andrea, do you, do you want to talk quickly about incentives um, for uh, or re reducing incentives for stealing data? Do you have any thoughts about that? How do you how do you sort of you know reduce the incentive or somehow lessen the value such that the, the value of a hack goes down? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, so it, it, it won't um, pertain to unique identifiers, so like a social security number, because that's hard to change. Except unless um, so, what what the first thing that came to mind was the French election and how um, how the Macron campaign responded. So part of, you know, in addition to sort of uh, laying the, the battle space for saying that they're being you know, attacked all the time, once they actually were attacked, they had basically certain parts of data, fake data, inter intermixed with real data. And so that when it was actually posted online, uh, it delegitimized the attackers because it was hard to tell what was real from what was fake within the data dump that they did. This reminds so, me actually, uh, for IP theft, some responses have been just adding flaws to a patent or adding flaws to a schematic, yep. um, making that like easier to steal. So people build it and then it explodes, you know, or something. Like that. Yeah, and so there is, I mean, so on the one hand, it's, it's, you can't do that everywhere and you're gonna obviously still have your crown jewels they protect, but sort of making those honeypots or leveraging deception in ways that, I'll say this, which is not new by the way, doing this. You know, this has been going on through, you know, corporate and, and you know, geopolitical espionage forever, but just actually leveraging that a bit more makes, which gets back to, can you actually even trust the data that's being dumped? And if you cannot, um, it's gonna limit the impact that it's going to have. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's not the, you know, the end all of it all. You, know, you still need to absolutely protect the core data, but there are some interesting ways, more creative ways to think about um, just incentivizing or, or making it so that, you know, that the, cr the credibility of the, the, the hack mm -hmm. uh, is in question versus, um, you know, the, the person act, the victim. Mm -hmm. And Edna, um, can you talk quickly um, in response to the last question about law enforcement and um, responses to an attack and how you approach that both in the aftermath of an attack and sort of in, in normal state, if you will, in between? So um, the question as posed was one that probably can't be answered publicly, but it was, you know, what do you do in house when attack hits? I, I mean, there's no shock there. I, I think the way you asked it was, do you use third parties? Do you do it all yourself? Um, I think it depends on the size of the company. Quite frankly, your forensic skills. Uh, you know, Cisco not only has a, a body of security experts, we also have Talos, uh, which is threat intelligence, which you can't buy, it's free. 
you can just get it. Um, subscribe to it if you would like. Um, and uh, so a combination of that and in combination, I think, with some of the relevant government actors um, who can sometimes assist. It depends on the nature of the attack. Uh, you know, attacks, attackers have different motivations, right? And so a very patient, well-funded nation state attacker is going to use a very different set of techniques and you can get different help from the government. Um, those who are in it for the money, uh, down and dirty, looking to do something quickly, um, the government funding uh, of research may not be targeted there, and that would be, quite frankly, an inappropriate use of government money that comes from citizens. So you may not find as much use, other than, um, you know, everybody ought to know who their FBI, relevant FBI contacts are, because they do keep track of what all of us are sharing with them, um, and they can be really useful. Um, sorry if that was a vague answer, but it was intentionally so. <laughs> okay, and with that, we're going to wrap up. Thanks very much. Thank you.